And in a way, it's very different from a lot of other uh, guidances that we've had recently. Because he was dealing with a scholar. Uh, and as such, uh, he had two tasks to do, I believe. One, of course, was to get to know this man. And the other uh, was to do shakabuku to him. So, in a way, the greatest uh, interest in this guidance and the greatest value we can get from it is the way Sensei approached uh, this matter of making sure that he took the first step in doing shakabuku to him. He uh, announces at the end of this uh, and proposes to this scholar uh, that they should. Uh, have, uh, do a dialogue about Buddhism which was published in book form but first of course he had to lead him from Hinayana Buddhism which he was an expert at he had established himself as uh, one of the foremost what are termed Buddhologists it's a horrid word isn't it but the foremost Buddhologist in Europe. That means to say that he, he was a recognized and very well recognized scholar in Buddhism, but the Buddhism which most scholars in Europe know about is Hinayana Buddhism. This is because uh, in the days of uh, the colonial empires, both in France particularly and in Great Britain, uh, the Buddhism which they found in India and Southeast Asia going back several hundred years was Hinayana Buddhism, which is still practiced, of course, to this day in places like uh, Sri Lanka or Burma or uh, what used to be called Indochina, uh, where the countries of Vietnam and Cambodia and so on, which were part of the French colonial empire are. So therefore, everything that came back uh, to Europe were to do with that particular sort of Buddhism. It happened that that was where colonialism uh, took place. Mahayana Buddhism, as you know, traveled northeast. Uh, from the north of India through to China, on to Korea and on to Japan. And those areas didn't really come into uh, the colonial bracket, as it were, of those times. So even Mr. Toda used to joke about what he called London Buddhism. Because Japanese scholars after World War II, in a revival of interest in Buddhism, which was a natural reaction to the militaristic governments of pre-war days, who tried to reintroduce into Japan allegiance to the religion called Shinto, which is a sort of primitive nature worship. But the important thing about Shinto was that it, it taught that the emperor of Japan was a god and therefore was divine and they used this uh, pre in the years leading up to World War II in order to create uh, a nation which was ruled absolutely by the military authorities but in the name of the god who was the emperor you understand difficult to believe that in such a short period ago, really just a matter of 50 or 60 years, uh, the people uh, could have been uh, oppressed through such a system. But because uh, in the, all the ancient history of Japan, this was the belief, uh, therefore uh, the Japanese people uh, responded to it sort of understandable in the light of that, this ancient belief that 
went back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years that their emperor was a god. So you can see, uh, therefore, that uh, by the end of World War II, in a way, the Japanese scholars who wanted to revive their understanding of Buddhism, uh, in a sense, had to turn to the West because everything else had disappeared under this cloud of Shintoism in Japan itself. So they came to the universities of Europe in order to refresh and revive their understanding of Buddhism and in order, most importantly, to use the great uh, libraries of books on Hinayana Buddhism which existed in this country and in France particularly. So it's from this background that uh, this gentleman, Dr. Cole, uh, this is where he came from. He was actually trained as an economist and uh, due to a, a seed which was sown into him really when he was a young boy, uh, he felt something important about Buddhism. So although he was an economist, he began to study Hinayana Buddhism and became, through that, uh, the foremost Buddhologist in Europe today. So uh, it's very interesting, this dialogue, because it's very apparent that he hasn't got a clue about uh, Nichin Shoshu Buddhism or the, the movement of SGI, uh, he didn't, hasn't realized that already Buddhism is spreading. Nichiren Daishon is Buddhism is spreading uh, to all the corners of the earth. So one has to bear that in mind when you're reading this. He came really with very little knowledge of what SGI was up to. I think he'd met one or two people in Nichiren Shoshu Francaise, uh, but apart from that, he knew nothing about the SGI movement at all. Therefore, in a way, what he says, even to us maybe, at times seems a bit naive about uh, the importance, for example, of uh, teaching Buddhism in a way which is understood by people in the West. He didn't even realize that there were uh, some millions of people overseas who were already practicing Buddhism. However, uh, he was ripe for Shakabuku, and right towards the end of this dialogue, that is what Sensei begins to do in great earnest. Probably not with any idea that he was likely to practice, but then that, in a sense, is of course important, but on the other hand, uh, so far as the mission of this scholar is concerned, uh, not a necessity. Sometimes we get supported better by people who are not practicing this Buddhism, especially in the scholarly world, because scholars are always suspicious uh, that views given are biased by those who are actually practicing a religion. So Dr. Cole is a very important person. He is already famous as a Buddhologist. Therefore, if he, which it looks as if he will, begins to understand, through Sensei teaching him, the greatness of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, then he could very easily help us greatly to overcome the ignorance which exists in the minds of scholars in Europe today about Nichiren Daishonin himself and about his Buddhism and about uh, Soka Gakkai International and of course NSUK. So of course there are some scholars who are beginning to totally understand people like Dr. Brian Wilson but they're a rarity still. You can still go to the British Museum or other famous uh, museums in this country and you'll find totally erroneous uh, uh, captions 
under various exhibits about Nichiren Daishonin and his Buddhism to this very day. So in the coming years, we have to put that right. We have to educate the scholars. And that's no mean task, because scholars are notoriously, any scholars here, there must be, for, forgive me, scholars are notoriously uh, uh, difficult to educate because they have their own set views and they're following their own set channel of inquiry and investigation. And it's not so easy, particularly from people who are already, in their view, biased and therefore have a one-sided view. So this uh, discussion is interesting with that sort of background. So having said that, uh, let's ask Paul to begin to read. The West is waiting for the Buddhist philosophy of compassion, a dialogue between President Daisaku Ikeda and French pedologist Serge Christophe Kolm, held at the Seiko Shimbun building, Tokyo, May the 21st, 1990. Without a doubt, the age is waiting for Buddhism. The spread of Buddhism in the West is more important than people imagine. Buddhism does not belong only to the East. It is a universal teaching. In fact, for more than 2,000 years, it was well established over half the globe, serving as a spiritual sustenance of many peoples. There is no reason that the West alone should be an exception. Dr. Colm expressed his conviction with force. It is precisely Buddhist thought which will heal the direst sicknesses of the West. The ability of the traditional Western religions to tackle the fundamental problems of our age, such as the need to conquer egoism, is limited. Buddhism, in contrast, offers surprisingly clear, almost miraculous answers to such dilemmas. And the movement that you, President Ikeda, are working to further is the perfect response to the needs of our time. So as you can see, at least one thing this scholar, Dr. Cole, had read a number of sensei's books. So although he didn't understand anything about SGI or NSUK or not very much about Nichiren Shoshu Francais even, he had read some of Sensei's books and he was obviously spellbound by them because they were stating so clearly what Hinayana Buddhism uh, is unable to state and explain in terms which the ordinary person can understand. So he was ready on the way, already on the way to believing that there must be something incredibly great in this Buddhism, which this man, Ikeda, was practicing and teaching, and about which he'd written many books. Okay, on we go. President Ikeda expressed his gratitude for Dr. Colm's understanding and spoke of the significance of Bodhisattva Fugen, universally worthy who appears in the 28th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. The Fu in Fugen's name means universal, and Gen means worthy, that is, wise. The wisdom of a universal life that extends throughout the entire world, the entire universe, never exhausted, is universally worthy. And because Fugen puts that wisdom into action in the form of compassion, he is a bodhisattva. When the Lotus Sutra is spread throughout the world, it is regarded as the activity of the powers of Bodhisattva Fugen. And people who, searching for universal truth, assist the spread of Buddhism through their academic capabilities, can perhaps be called a Bodhisattva Fugen. So straight away, in those words, Sensei is explaining to this gentleman uh, that uh, if he really understands uh, or takes the trouble to understand Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, then he will be fulfilling a great mission. The mission which Bodhisattva Fugen represents, the Bodhisattva universally worthy. Now, Buddhist, Bodhisattva Fugen, uh, the characters for his name are on the Gohonzon. This is a very important point for us 
in our, in our ordinary lives in NSUK or for members anywhere else in the world. There are two of Shakyamuni's disciples on the Gohons. One is Fugen and the other is Monju. And they are on the Gohons and represent all the other disciples of Shakyamuni, all of whom had particular special abilities. Probably some of you know those. We won't dwell on them today. But uh, Shariputra, for example, was the greatest and the most worthy in terms of wisdom and so on. Each person, Yaku, uh, was uh, particularly an expert and had great ability in medicine or curing illnesses. So these are all these various uh, abilities of those disciples on the Gohons and are represented by Fugen and Monju. Now Fugen especially represents uh, those people who do not practice but who have a mission of great importance for Kosen Rufu such as, as I've already explained, a scholar who by his neutrality by him not practicing is able to influence others particularly in the academic field about the supremacy of the Lotus Sutra in all the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha and uh, arising from that the absolute supremacy of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. That it actually conveys the ultimate truth about life. So all these people are represented on the Gohons and by Fuga. Dr. Toynbee, for example, served Kosen Rufu to an immense degree by uh, agreeing to hold a dialogue with Sensei who at that time wasn't known in this country at all. But something attracted him to this man and he decided to hold a dialogue and they should write a book together. That book called Choose Life has already proved to be enormously important not only because its content is great and very enlightening to a lot of people, uh, but also uh, because Dr. Toynbee was a renowned figure, great historian, famous throughout the world. So all over the world, uh, those who had over the years followed Toynbee and agreed with his views of history, which were quite unique, incidentally, because he clearly could see the working of the law of cause and effect in history. All those people who agreed with his philosophy of history uh, were influenced by this book. So in this way, he was protecting, wasn't he, the movement for Kosen Roof, protecting all of us in helping Sensei in that way. And of course, since then, have been many others. Uh, another example is Dr. Wilson, who wrote the book called Human Values in a Changing World with Sensei, uh, a famous and very uh, honorable and well-known scholar of Oxford University, also his college. Other people whose names you've read, Dr. Peche, René Huig, and so on. This is their mission in this lifetime. So we can learn a lot from this. We should never be bitter or disappointed if someone who seems to be uh, about to practice finally doesn't do so. He may still be a representative of Bodhisattva Fugen so far as uh, Kosen Rufu in your environment is concerned. He or she though they may not practice, may feel the rightness and greatness of Buddhism. And through that, they'll do Shakabuku also, because they will support and praise the activities of members of Venice UK, for example, in their area, yet at the same time 
uh, they'll never practice themselves. A further reason is that even if a person understands one principle of Buddhism, it can begin to change their lives, their outlook on life. If someone understands, for example, Esho Funi, the relationship between us as an individual and our environment, that total connection between the two, then that person will have a different view of the world and of life and of their surroundings. And it makes them think deeply and opens up something new and fresh in their lives which is good. So this is why uh, Sensei talks so much these days about sowing seeds wherever we go. This is the obvious answer, isn't it? In a way, it's the natural way just to go talking about Buddhism when we meet people, whether or not they practice. Either way, we can bring about something important for Kosen Rufu in them. Of course, most important is that for their happiness is that they should practice. But on the other hand, their karma may not permit them to do so. But still they can be of enormous value. And through that, of course, they are fulfilling a mission. In other words, in the incredible rhythm and pattern of life, these people exist in this world at this moment for this purpose. You understand? So we should never worry about whether someone's going to practice. We don't know anyway. But because human beings, all of us are so good at making judgment about other people, you know, we look at people and say, oh, that fellow will never practice. No point in talking to him. Or, or probably he'll get angry and pour his pint of beer over me. It does, there's no need to worry about all that. We can't judge, can we? I'm sure many of us have learned that lesson. People we never expected to practice. Practice. Especially the closer they are to us. My father, you'll never practice. You know. But maybe, you know, suddenly, to your amazement, he will. On the other hand, maybe he won't. So the importance of sowing seeds wherever we go is very great. And if we're really doing our gongyo joyfully, or even if not joyfully because we feel awful one morning, you know, we make a real go at it and feel better after it, we'll feel when we go out into the world from in front of our gongs, like talking about it, when an opportunity occurs. This is crucial. And this is natural shakabuku. That's the point. Natural shakabuku arising out of us feeling that we're getting somewhere in life through the power of this gods and feeling some sort of joy through that and gratitude, which you heard all about yesterday. So, uh, Bodhisattva Fugen and all those who represent him, as I say, are on the Gohons, actually on the Gohons, their mission. In their next lifetime, they'll be a Buddha, if they wish, but maybe they would prefer to continue with that sort of mission. Either way, they're serving the Buddha even though they don't practice now. To follow. Great, okay, let's go on. In that sense, I have the high highest respect to the understanding you have expressed of our movement based on your precious research. And just as you say, the universal wisdom of Buddhism will no doubt reach out to embrace the West. Further, it is important to note that true Buddhism is never dogmatic. It is an accepting and adaptable teaching. 
In fact, it allows the multifarious varieties of human individuals, as well as different cultures, with their respective histories and traditions, to function at their peak. It revives them and encourages their development. That is the universally worthy power of the Buddhist teaching. Universal refers to a truth that never changes, whatever the time or place. And worthy means the autonomous wisdom that leads specific individuals and societies to happiness because it is based on that principle. Because of that, the spread of Buddhism to the West cannot be a forced phenomenon. The essential thing is for Buddhism to contribute as much as possible to the lives of the people in each country and society. In modern times, Western thought has dominated the entire world. Now we find ourselves at the dead end of modernism, and I'm convinced that the time has arrived when we must introduce the essence of Buddhism, which evolved in the East, to the West as a magnificent system of thought. So, of course, Sensei is praising Buddhism there, and he's particularly referring to its universality. And this is the unique thing about Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, that it doesn't require a special way of life. You don't have to shave your head. You don't have to eat a particular sort of food. You don't have to give up smoking cigarettes. You don't have to do this or that or the other. What you have to do is to believe and get proof of the existence of cause and effect. And cause and effect is what can guide one into doing the most sensible thing for one's happiness of yourself and also, of course, of others. So, uh, this universality is not yet understood by Dr. Cohn, because he didn't know anything about SGI. He didn't know, even, that there were a Buddhist active groups of people practicing Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism in 115 countries in the world. It must have been a shock when he learned that. And many of the things he's saying, as I said, uh, show that ignorance. And what Sensei, of course, is talking about there in universe, in talking about you, the universality of his Buddhism, is the existence, which doesn't teach him yet, of a principle called Zui Ho Bini. Zui Ho Bini, uh, which means literally Zui Ho. Uh, keeping the precept or precepts and bini local circumstances. In other words, Zuiho Bini means that although in matters of faith we keep the precepts strictly, that is to say we practice as best we can exactly as the Buddha taught, but the way we do our activities uh, suit the culture, the customs, and the laws of the country concerned. Zui Ho Bini. So, in other words, this Buddhism, which of course has already been proved, can be practiced in any country in the world. It can adapt to any form of culture and any race of people any type of person, of whatever age, of whatever intellect, and so on. As long as we keep matters of faith strict, exactly as the Buddha taught, so we make offerings to the gods and exactly as the Buddha taught, with candles and incense, and evergreen, and so on, and water. We do gongya, citing the sutra and chanting Dhanokuri every day as much as we can, exactly as the Buddha taught. We do Shakabuku. We introduce others to the teachings exactly as the Buddha taught. All this 
is strict and correct and always must be, must not far into the future. In due course of time, you all will be preserving, as you are now indeed, the strictness of the teachings of faith. But in the way we do our activities, we can adapt to anything. Things are changing. In ten years' time, you will not be doing activities in exactly the way you're doing them now. There may be quite subtle differences in society and in social trends, which you want, you'll feel naturally you want to keep pace with. When Buddhism came from Japan to here, it was very difficult for those early pioneers to practice it in any other way than it was practiced in Japan. Because that's where they'd gone to see how to practice. So gradually, of course, they began to adapt it to the British way. Same in France, same in Germany, same in America, and so on. If you go to America, the meetings are very different to our meetings. They represent, you know, America. America is different. It's nothing like Britain, though we speak the same language. But this is the wonderful thing about this. I'm sure, uh, gradually, uh, I'm not only sure, I'm certain that in Ireland, for example, uh, you're developing a way of practicing this Buddhism which is very distinctly Irish. And in Greece and in Turkey you will also invent or develop your way of doing activities. But your activities of faith, the way you view the Gons and the way you practice it, the way you study the Gosho and sense this guidance is strict. Everyone understand? Great. So, um, Sensei is also mentioning here, because of that, the spread of Buddhism to the West cannot be a forced phenomenon. Well, I think I've already covered that point, that introducing Buddhism to others should be, one should, it should be a natural process. All we need to do is to keep the each in it to teach others. Now I say all we have to do, but of course that is sometimes very difficult. We get wrapped up in ourselves and in our problems, don't we? Looking inwards all the time. Whereas this practice, Nichiren Daishonin clearly stated, is practice for yourself and practice for others in perfect balance if you do not practice for others, you'll get stagnant, heavy, you'll feel your life is not advancing. Though you may be chanting 10,000 Daimoku a day, you'll feel somehow you're getting nowhere. This is because it is an unnatural thing in the very nature of life to concentrate all the time on oneself. And of course it's the trap that hundreds and thousands and millions of human beings fall into. If you're trapped within yourself, then your problems will seem so big that you'll never overcome them. Never. Because concentrating on your problems, your desires, your wishes, well, I could easily say my desires, my wishes, makes everything so big, fills your whole life. So these problems seem so huge, you back away from them, and you feel you'll never get through, and you won't. If you practice for others, then you're taking yourself out of yourself. People say, oh, I must go on a holiday. I must have a holiday this year. Practicing for others is a sort of holiday from yourself. Uh. 
But this is so important. Of course, it's a human thing to get caught up with oneself. Everyone's doing it. The whole trend of society, the whole trend of the media, everything else is directed towards that. But this Buddhism can pull you out of it. It pulls us out of it and we find balance in our lives. If you look at nature, nothing in nature is practicing only for itself. You can't think of one animal or creature or insect in nature that is practicing only for itself. It always has a connection with other creatures. It provides them with food or whatever. You see so many examples birds that sit on hippopotamuses necks and peck the insects off them are doing a service to the hippo as well as to themselves and so on. Everything is interconnected. Everything in the entire universe is living off something else. We have to live in that way. People have got to live off us. What we can give them in the form of hope and confidence and joy. If we fail to do that, we're failing ourselves in the end, and we're the ones who suffer. This is a great truth. Okay, let's go on. Tom, I agree. There is an Arabian proverb, though the dogs bark, the caravan passes majestically on. It is wonderful that the Sokka Gakkai bravely marches forward on the path of its own belief. Moreover, without losing your own faith, you carry on open dialogues with the world and promote cultural interchange as well. Usually it is very difficult to pursue both of these directions at the same time. I am deeply impressed by your leadership. What he meant there was that Sensei, though he travels the world and meets people of all different types, who are uh, at the top of their countries in one way or another, is never influenced by them. His faith is never compromised, in other words. Always, in the end, he comes back to the strong point of his own faith in the tradition and Buddhism. Can we go? Ikeda, you are too kind. Nichiren Daishonin, whom we revere, said words to the effect that his cry is like the roar of a lion. With all his might, he fought against the dictatorial religions of his day and the secular authorities who oppressed the people and attacked him. Inheriting the authentic teaching of Buddhism from the time of Shakyamuni, he battled for his life with the established sects of Buddhism, which had draped themselves in the mantle of tradition to sanction their alliance with the powerful and the special privileges that they had acquired. The most basic Buddhist teaching is that everything is change, a never-ending series of changes. Nothing is ever still. What Buddhism seeks to do is, in the midst of that changing reality from which we can never divorce ourselves, in the midst of the mud of reality, to help us achieve a state of the highest hope and fulfillment and to lead society and our environment in the direction of supreme peace and prosperity. That is the original practice of Buddhism. Of course, if you lose your faith, you no longer have a religion. And if you also lose track of the pulse of the age and your society, you also lose track of true Buddhism. What Buddhism teaches is a universal wisdom that allows, from the inside, the individuality of all existence to be in its most effective manner. Cole. I understand perfectly. The activities of the Soka Gakkai and NSF, Nichiren Shoshu of France, are especially important as so many other Buddhist organizations tend to isolate themselves from society. So really, the important uh, lines there are towards the end of Sensei's talk. Of course, if you lose your faith, you no longer have religion. And if you also lose track of the pulse of the age in your society, you also lose track of true Buddhism. Can one think of another religion that would say such a thing as that? It would just never come up in thought or conversation. 
that if you lose track of the pulse of the age in your society, you also lose track of true Buddhism. In other words, Buddhism equals daily life and nothing else. The last words Sensei said when he left Taplow Court, waved goodbye to everybody last year, was, don't forget that Buddhism is daily life. That was the last thing he said. Got into his car and said goodbye. So important. Buddhism is daily life. So, uh, we have to view daily life, of course, through, therefore, the eyes of the Buddha. Not through uh, the eyes of a common mortal. Because all we'll see through the eyes of the common mortal is what the media want us to see. All we understand is what the media want us to understand. And that is very dangerous, as we all understand and well know. So if we look with the eyes of the Buddha, we look deeper. How many of us get trapped into being emotional because of something the media has said or done? Oh, I disagree with that. Or, you know, some sort of quite violent emotion. I remember when the Falklands War began, and one young man rang me up. He's such an honest chap. And he said, Mr. Corson, I, do, I really don't know what's happening to me and what I should do. Ah, I've just been watching the television saying, with everyone waving goodbye to the, to the ships of the Royal Navy going out to the Falklands Islands. And he said, I feel I want to cheer and say, yes, go on, give him a good bash. <laughs> And then he said, suddenly I, f I realize I'm a Buddhist. What am I doing thinking like that? But of course at that time, the media were really whipping things up, you know. And of course they were playing on people's emotions. So we have to be very careful not to be swept away by that. We look through the Buddha's eyes. Actually, what it comes down to is that we look through the power of the cons at the inherent causes and effects in life and don't get swayed and our minds distorted by only looking at the external causes and effects, isn't it? If you think about it that way. In other words, Buddhism can look or shine a great light deep into any problem in our own lives or in the world or society and it lights up the inherent cause the root cause of everything not all this stuff that's going on on the surface of life that can make us so emotional if we don't learn to do that then we are not able to use Buddhism to the best advantage. We look, in other words, through the eyes of our daimoku, if you like, at what's happening in the world. We see the inherent causes and the deep effects of those inherent causes. And we can begin to understand and therefore uh, be compassionate to those who are suffering by being caught up in the storms and whirlpools of emotion that many of these situations create. In other words, we can stand like a rock in the midst of all that stuff because we can see deeper and understand the true reason, the deep reason for what is going on. So if you look at Eastern Europe now, going through great sufferings in a way, and there'll be more yet, as people struggle to find the right ideology on which to base their, their country's way of life, and their way of life, and they're not going to find it in a hurry, 
and there'll be all sorts of arguments and contention before they reach a settled, happy way of life. In many cases, I believe, this is what Sensei predicted a year ago. And we actually studied it, I think, on summer course. And then it all happened in the winter. So there'll be great storms and emotional troubles and outbursts, therefore, of sort of uh, hatred and dislike of one faction against another faction. Since he said, it won't be a time of war, it'll be a time of, strug of a struggle of ideologies. But we, with the Gons, can look deep through all that emotional stuff, really understand the reason for this, that, or the other. It's usually simple. The truth is usually very simple. And through that, through the fact that we can stand 